Welcome to Wednesday Live. Well, not live because we had to pre-record this due to a conflict that I had, but that didn't stop Tiffany Tavares from making sure that she added value and served you and this week. Tiffany Tavares is the Vice President of Community Relations at Wells Fargo, where she implements the company's corporate responsibility priorities through strategic philanthropy, stakeholder engagement, and team member volunteerism. Numerous organizations throughout the region have recognized her work and commitment to civic engagement and impact, including the Forum of Executive Women, Philadelphia City Council, Leadership Philadelphia, Impacto, Philadelphia Business Journal, and the United Way of Greater Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey. She currently serves as a member of Governor Tom Wolf's Pennsylvania Commission for Women, a member of the Board of Directors for Esprezana and Temple Contemporary, as well as a board chair of Monument Lab. She is a first generation college graduate who has earned degrees from both Temple University and the University of the Arts. Through the variables of race, complexion, gender, ethnicity, sexuality, religion, zip code, citizenship status, and income are key indicators of how well we do in this life and how long we get to live it. Her career has been dedicated to ensuring that exceptions to the rules, like herself, become the standard. I've known Tiffany for many years and I'm so grateful to learn from her and share her with everyone today. Welcome, Tiffany. Yay! I am so excited. Thank you so much for having me, Shannon. It really means a lot. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to connect and learn from you and just hear how this year has been for you. Here we are. Why? What's happening? Anything <laughs> happening this year? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Yes, I know. It's it's really it's been a mystery and it's been a hidden secret to most people. <laughs> but it's December 2020, which means that we are in the last lap of this marathon. And I think it's a great time for us to be reflective. And I know you're someone who does a lot of introspection and work on yourself and, you know, try to find meaning. And I know lessons from your mom have been like, what did you learn from this? How did, how can you grow from this? So like looking back on this past year, like what are some things that you know now that you didn't know in 2019? Oh, how much time do you have for that list, Shannon? My goodness. Uh, well, first of all, again, thank you so much for having me. I think that's such an appropriate question. Uh, you know, and, and it's not to say that I get stuck in my own head, but I do try to make time to really mm. think and reflect about myself, uh, challenge myself, because all the work that I do on me, then in turn, I can try to do and help others. Yeah. So, you know, with regards to, you know, I guess kind of a, a lesson learned or something that I'm so much more aware of now than I was in, in 2019, which honestly seems like 10 years ago at this point, <laughs> um, is that uh, resiliency is not dead. <laughs> honestly, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's really remarkable to see the resiliency of people, uh, to see that no matter how tired they get, no matter how exhausted, how angry, how frustrated they get, Mm -hmm. that there's still this little glimmer of hope, you know, and I think about that whole quote, you know, um, keep hope alive. This year has proven that hope has, uh, has never died. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God. Right. I mean, I think that is like oxygen for most of us to get through the year is hope and resilience. Mm -hmm. I love that you're saying that. And like, you know, what are the things that you think have gotten you through? I mean, you're a tough woman. You, you are, a, a figure of resilience, right? You, and you do it with a smile, which is what I love about you, Tiffany. You have this like grit and grace combination, which is so beautiful. But like, what are, what are some things you would say were essential to you to make this year livable and perhaps even like a great opportunity to learn? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, I like that grit and grace. Let me write that down. That's my memoir, you. the title book, right? Um, so let's see, there, there are a few things to be honest. You know, yeah. it's both a blessing and a curse to just have this battery where I keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and I say it's a blessing because it's brought me to a lot of wonderful opportunity, got me to connect with a lot of wonderful people and just enjoy some wonderful spaces. Mm -hmm. But it's also a curse because that means the reverse of that is that you have to be really intentional about stopping, yeah. really intentional about slowing down and really intentional about being okay with just 
gliding, mm-hmm. right? You, you don't have to go any direction. You don't have to do, I mean, you could just literally just cruise, you know, that whole cruise control. Some, yes. it, it, for some people, it makes them crazy. You're like, wait a minute, they're waiting for the shoe to drop. They're, they're waiting for something to go wrong. And sometimes right. it's not about happy or sad or good or bad. It's just about cruise control. Can you maintain a certain level of speed, yes. of sanity and soundness for mm-hmm. just a consistent amount of time before you decide to go rev up or rev down again? Yeah. And for me, uh, this year has definitely brought obviously that opportunity. You know, I'm, and, and I say that with gratitude because not everyone has the privilege to work from home. You know, luckily I do. And Mm -hmm. I don't take that for granted, right? So when people say, oh, how are you? And, you know, I hear right away frustrations and complaints and I have to stay inside. And, you know, for me, I say, look, I'm very lucky to have the holy trinity of safety, good health and employment. Yeah. Outside of that, don't ask me any other questions. (laughs) Seriously. Yeah. Really? It's serious. Yeah. Wow. Safety, employment and good health. The holy trinity. Yes. Yes, because there are, I mean, there are a number of communities, <laughs> thank you, there are a number of, um, you know, individuals, families, um, you know, entire communities that don't have that, and yeah. I think that for those that don't have that, it really, the kind of that power and influence for us to ensure that other people do, that's, that's when we have to go to work and try to provide those opportunities and support, you know, even if it is just saying, hi, how are you, I just yeah. want to check on you. I know mm-hmm. you have a full-time job and you're taking care of, you know, three little kids at home. And I just want to let you know, I was thinking about you. Yeah. Again, you may not think, Hey, I'm, I'm not solving the world's problems. I'm not, you know, cure, uh, curing COVID-19, mm-hmm. but to at least extend that love and warmth. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, and to be honest, kind of like, it's like investing in faith, you know, that's what, to me, what you do, you, you get people to invest in the faith of mm-hmm. other people. And to me, the value of that is just, um, it's always going to surpass the time that it took. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of things in what you just said. One is about perspective, you know, your ability to have perspective on things and to recognize how fortunate you are and not to compare yourself to other people, but to recognize that there are people that have much worse circumstances and there are people that are really suffering from unemployment or any kind of uh, physical illness, whether they had that prior to COVID or they acquired that during this time or people that are really lonely or, you know, in, in all of these ways suffering. And, you know, I think that your perspective taking is something that we can all take to ourselves and say, how could I shift my perspective if I've been focused on what I don't have versus what I do have. Right. So to be onto that. And then you talked about gratitude and just to be grateful right? To take Mm -hmm. stock in, Mm -hmm. in what you have. And then another thing you said, that's really interesting is about your predisposition to take action and that you're, you know, just like it's a (laughs) blessing and a curse. And so how hard it has been to just like slow down and be really intentional about refueling yourself. That's right. And and the one thing I actually want to highlight um, that you saying, it just reminded me is that oftentimes when people want to talk about that, they'll use the word balance. And I actually can't stand that word. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like the word Preach. balance. Uh, I, I just, oh, it has such negative connotations, especially when it comes to, to women and, and mm-hmm. professional women that, you know, work and, and have to balance home life, et cetera. Um, so for me, it's about integration. Yeah. Uh, it's about how do I integrate certain practices in order to actually strengthen that, mm-hmm. that, that pace and that speed and that intensity that I go, right? Because it's not about balance. Because when you think about an actual balance, yeah. there are two opposing sides and there's mm-hmm. a constant, like you have to choose one over the other. And yeah. that's not the case. You know, I always think of myself as, I know this is going to, you know, I, I, I wish I could draw this out for, for you. Yeah. Well, I know you have an analogy of a road. <laughs> I know. I, I always think of myself as a car. Yes. On good. a two lane highway. Yep. And, you know, both are going the same direction. They both support your life, whether that be home or work or whatever the two big things may be yeah. for you. And you're simply just constantly changing lanes, but they're both moving in the same direction and they're both there for you. They're not opposing yeah. each other. Right. And, and so for me, it's about integration more so than it is about, about balance. Yeah. And it's also about the GPS or like the direction of the road. Right. Cause I mean, That's right. so often we're just like speeding on down this road and then we're like, how the hell did I get here? Right. This yeah. is, is this yeah. what I wanted? But, and 
again, you never that's, really, you know, that's most why people the, don't think about it. Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. And I was gonna say that one of the best things about, you know, the best trip that you take is that it's the integration of both GPS, but then your instinct of where to go. Yes. You can't rely on just one or the other. There's sometimes like, you know what? This looks familiar. I really think that we should go here. Or you know what? There's something, tell me there's something over there. And I think it's, it's, it's just about using multiple points of reference for where to go next, right? Yes. When, when people are in a relationship, whether that be their, their partner, uh, their, their spouse, whether it be their best friend, that's not the only source of kind of like social inspiration and guidance and protection they have. Yeah. You have a whole people portfolio. And I think that when it comes to decision-making, why do we have a diversity of friends and, and, and kind of, you know, your tribe and your trust circle, but then rely on only your job for civic engagement or mm -hmm. any source of development or only rely on that, you know, one event you go to in order to connect with people. I mean, there yeah. are so many multiple uh, sources of information and inspiration. You just have to curate, you know, the, the work in the museum that you want to see of your life. Yes. Oh, that's so, such a beautiful image. And then we were talking about traveling. I know you're a big traveler and you love going to all different oh. countries and cultures and all, and like that combination of the GPS and the intuition and to recognize that your intuition is data. You know, sometimes right. people don't think it's as valid as what, you know, Google Maps is telling you, but it's, it's data and it's really valuable. 110%. I mean, and, and people always kind of get a little weird out and they're like, oh, they're like, you know, what are some of your strengths and what are you relying on? And I always say, you know, my instinct. They're like, huh? You know, that always throws them off because I, I almost feel like as an adult, you are, it's funny, as a child, you're trained to follow your in instincts. Don't talk to that stranger, right? Yeah. Don't touch that bad thing. Don't go there. Mm -hmm. Somehow you expect a child to follow their instinct, but then when they become an adult, it's like everything has to be in front of you in order to know it's a good thing that's happening and go that direction. Yeah. And again, I think it's about that integration. You know, some of the best experiences I've ever had in my life, the best conversations, um, they've been with people that, to be honest, totally random when I've gone on trips that I connect with and I still mm -hmm. keep in touch with sometimes and I completely adore. Yeah. Um, you know, had it not been for me just, you know, what, let me just talk to this person and say hi and ask a random question about like, oh, so how long have you been working here? And then it, you know, spirals into like, you know, going to a family dinner and uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> watching a cool game. And, you right. know, and, and for me, that's what makes life really rich. You know, those, mm -hmm. those um, unexpected and unplanned um, opportunities for, for growth and, mm -hmm. and those opportunities for love. Yes. For love. Totally. I remember you had a post a while back and it was of you, I believe you were in Italy. And it was you, Berlin. It was Berlin. Berlin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you said that the connection happened because of a smile, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's so funny. I, um, I love food, you know, and I'm not going to lie. I'm here to own it. And yeah. Amen. when I travel, um, I was in Berlin and I've heard that they have uh, an extensive, like really awesome Ethiopian community. And I love Ethiopian food. Yeah. So I remember I got, um, you know, in a cab and I saw that the driver had an Ethiopian flag hanging from his rearview mirror. And I yeah. said, sir, I know this is going to sound totally random, but like, can you recommend, you know, your favorite, like your favorite Ethiopian restaurant? He's looking at me in the review, like, what do you know? You know, like, what mm -hmm. are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, I love to eat, you know, Yemisi Ali Cha and I'm Doral Tibbs. And he, he almost crashed the damn car, to be honest. He's like, oh my goodness. Okay. You're serious. And that's when he like kind of leaned over. He's like, let me tell you about this place. Yeah. So he tells me about this um, cafe and, you know, it was a, it was pretty far out, but I, I got there. Yeah. And um, they had just opened. So I was the first customer and I'm sitting outside and um, the woman was very, very sweet. And we started talking and, you know, she said, oh, you know, no one's here, but I know you didn't order any coffee, but I would love to offer you some coffee. I just made myself some. It's like, oh, that would be lovely. So she's yeah. pouring it and she's smiling just because she's like, oh, this is so cool. I'm offering yeah. coffee to a stranger. She said, yeah. yes. And I said, oh my goodness, you know, you seem so kind and like, you know, tell me about, you know, your story and like, yeah. what is, do you own this place? Like, what's, what's the deal here? And I, honestly, I can't even tell you the exact components of everything we talked about, but we ended up talking for about three and a half hours. <laughs> Two of her friends later joined, including her best friend. So it was Ganet, um, Hayat and Yemesrash. Uh, and we just had a ball. I mean, we oh. talked for hours. Yemis Rash, um, who ended up inviting me 
to another cafe that she works at the following day. And she uh -huh. said, I make Ethiopian food at home oh. and I bring it to, you know, the cafe to sell. I'm yeah. Like, Are you serious? She's like, no, please come be my guest. And it was the first time I ever had homemade Ethiopian food. Oh my and goodness. I hung out with her for a few hours the following day. Oh. And we still keep in touch. And I just, you know, and it's so funny. I remember she said, you know, if you, one of the things I do remember <laughs> she shared with me is, you know, if you already walk around and you're calling everybody a stranger, you, that means you're declaring yourself a stranger even before you have a chance to say hello, right? That hello doesn't break that person being a stranger. It's what you mm -hmm. think of them prior to even engaging with them, you know, and that makes me think about people's limited capacity to share gratitude, it's really because of their limited capacity on what they find valuable. Mm -hmm. And so if you can find everything valuable, if you can find some value in everything, then you can show gratitude and be grateful for everything. And I've always been grateful for them. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you shared that story because that literally makes a picture like so much richer because the picture is just joy and love and community with people who were friends you hadn't met yet, AKA strangers. And now there are people that you feel so close to and you're lit up by and them to get to share their gifts with you. I mean, what a beautiful thing. Yeah. And, so I and think every that, once in a while, I still send her a message. I'm like, hey, I just want to let you know that I am expecting a meal when I go back to Berlin again. <laughs> and I would like to gain my 10 pounds again. Please, okay, last time. Please. and thank you. Yes. She's like, Absolutely, I got you covered. I'm like, great. <laughs> oh, she probably can't wait to oh, have you oh, there. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I can't wait for her. So this, oh, is, yeah. this is a match made in heaven. It's mutual, right. And yeah. you know, I think that speaks to your sense of adventure and what we were talking about with intuition and that open-mindedness. I mean, how does that translate into other areas of your life, Tiffany? Because I think that story is one of many that are about you being you, right? This is you mm -hmm. being you. You weren't like, well, let me try to be friendly. Or let me try to be curious. You just are. So like, yeah. you know, what are some things that you are learning about yourself and like, even how have you seen those hmm. blossom this year? Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question. There are a couple of things that come to mind. I mean, I think that oftentimes, and I'll just kind of relate it to even my, my career trajectory so far. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes there's this sense of, you know, if I'm in a particular sector, I need to connect with everyone in that sector and, and you know, that'll strengthen my skills and ability within that space to make impact and excel at what I do, et cetera. And, and yes, that, that might be true. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> and. value. All right. Yes. And, but there's still value in diversifying again, that people portfolio and where they come from, you know? So I remember, you know, it's funny, I kind of will connect it to, I know for a long time, I have always felt in my heart that, you know, that one of the grandest, um, you know, luxuries in life is the luxury of options, right? Mm -hmm. Because when, um, you know, I, I grew up as someone with a number of you know, limited options and sometimes unfortunately no option at all. And so for me, when I saw people that, you know, had money and all that, it wasn't about the money I realized for me that was so kind of, you know, made me in awe, um, yeah. but it was more about the freedom of option. You didn't have to choose whether or not you were going to pay a bill or have dinner. You yes. weren't going to have to choose whether or not you needed, you know, a, a new shirt for school or supplies, but it's just mm -hmm. a freedom of options. And I think that as we work, we work to either buy more things or more, buy more quality, a better quality of things. Again, it's always about increasing our options. Sure. I say, I say that to say, you know, for a long time, people say, so what do you want to do when you grow up? Right. You know, that yeah. kind of like, what's your long game plan? And I'd always say, it's really hard for me to answer because I don't know what my options are. Ah. And you know, so for me, I thought, you know what, I'm going to start researching people's jobs just to see what they do. I don't care whether or not it aligns with my interests. I don't care what their title is. Half the time I wanted to know because I didn't know what their title meant anyway. Yeah, <laughs> so sure. Good, you know, this was good research. <laughs> and funny enough, I ended up finding, um, I remember I was watching a soccer game and it was, um, you know, I noticed a particular team had a new logo on their jersey. And I thought, oh, you know what, that's the first time a Middle Eastern airline has ever sponsored a major sports team um, for soccer, international yeah. soccer. And I thought, oh, that, that must be someone's job to like secure that deal. And I don't know why that just occurred to me. I was like, oh, that must be someone's job. I was like, I wonder how I find that. Anyway, fast forward, I did some extensive research and I happened to find a gentleman's name and he was head of international sponsorships for Real Madrid. 
and I happened to be going to Madrid and I sent him a message. I was like, Hey, I want to know what you do and how yeah. you got there. Yeah. Um, so I know whether or not it's an optionist, whether or not I want to take over your job one day. And he <laughs> <laughs> loved Tiffany and he <laughs> responded and we met when I went to Madrid. And, uh -huh. we met, and he was so generous with his time. We met for like two and a half hours. Oh my gosh. He told me everything about, he did now, of course, on the outside, I'm meeting him really serious and we're, you know, I'm playing it cool. Yeah. On the inside, I'm screaming like, at a very high pitch sound. Yes. Because he gave me a tour of the stadium. Yes. I'm in like the boardroom, you know, Real Madrid. Like the word giddy comes to my mind. Yeah. I mean, they're, it's a multi billion dollar giddy. team and they're fantastic. And, I just thought I had no idea that this was a job. And once I kind of saw his title, I'm like, I want to know about that job. Sure. And so for me, talking to different people allows me to think about number one, how do I think about decision making? You know, what are some ways that people think that I can, I can adopt, you know, not to say that adopt for an, my, the, the entirety of my life, but I can sure. adopt for a moment for a transaction. Practice. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Best practices. And it has been a gift because I think that's that same what do people have to offer or what yeah. is it that I may have to offer that will remind them of something that they want to share. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of intentionality could be mutual and it could be a beautiful thing. But the first step is that you have to be open to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for everybody joining us today and watching and replay to think about what are your options? That's one of the key things you're saying is what are my options and what are the options that I don't even know exist and where could I find those options? That's right. And then that openness to like find people who have information that you need. So whatever that is, if it's a job you're interested in, if it's a neighborhood you want to move into, if it's a place you want to visit, whatever, you know, finding someone who has experience, top-notch experience preferred <laughs> and you know gaining that interest and and wondering and, and like using that to help you make your decision i think that's such sage wisdom for us to consider how we could apply that to our own lives yeah no i appreciate that i mean i don't think i'm honestly any different than anyone else i find that people have that curiosity i think the only difference is that for some, their question about a thing or a place or a person, it's mm -hmm. fleeting. They don't hold on to it. They're like, oh, I wonder what they do there. And then they just move on. They order their coffee, they order their meal, you know, they they walk back to their office. Yeah. But for me, all those fleeting questions, those moments, I have a, a notepad and I literally just write down things I wonder about, not things I'm looking to answer. Yeah. Not not things that I need to research, just things that I wonder about. And whenever huh. I'm in the, in the mood to research or think about something, or if I see something else, I'm like, oh, you know, I wondered about that. I didn't realize that that's a person that can help me yeah. think about it or answer that question, you know? So for yeah. me, it's not just always about finding an answer, so to speak, as much mm -hmm. as it is articulating the best version of the question that's going to reflect the thing you were just wondering about. That, that's so brilliant. And, you know, this is one of the things you have in common with Albert Einstein. Albert <laughs> Einstein said that if he had one hour to solve a problem, he'd spend the first 55 minutes thinking about what question to ask. Oh, that's, oh, I love that. I have never heard about, okay. I love that. Yeah. So Same. that's what you're saying is like, you know, what is the angle back to perspective too? Like what's the perspective I need to take? What's the angle I need to look at this through or what mm -hmm. even the angle that I tend to look at this through. Cause when you were saying earlier about like the affiliations or the, the people with whom you associate and then you're saying I have to expand that because then that would enable me to have like a wider perspective yeah, on no, whatever absolutely. it is that I'm looking at. Right. Absolutely. And I think it look, and it's natural. I think that if you come up with questions and you're a person who likes to get things done, there's a pressure like, I can't, I don't want to think about any more questions. There's pressure. That means I have to go and seek the answer. And that's yeah. not necessarily true. I think it's helpful to remind yourself of the things that you used to wonder about the things that you used to think about. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of time, you know, to be honest, I've even found actually, uh, I, I moved as you know, about a year ago. Yes. And I, and I, I remember finding some notebooks that I forgot I had, mm -hmm. and there were questions I would write down as a kid of things I was just thinking about. And even though I never got those questions answered, yeah. Or, and I, you know, still to this day, I have very little knowledge about it. It was fascinating for me now to see the questions and the things I was thinking about then. Yeah. And I've had that, I had no idea that I even had that, you know, practice, so to speak for that long. And, um, it was really, 
it was touching that to know that um, as much as I've changed, that there was still a core part of me that hadn't. And that was very oddly comforting, especially during this year. Yeah. And I've heard it said, I'm forgetting the author of this quote, it's James someone. I mean, curiosity is more mm-hmm. valuable than bravery. And that's around, you know, like that willingness to be open and, op- you know, even jotting things down to capture it. So you're not going down a rabbit hole every time you have a curious thought, but you're not losing that, that like wonder about yeah. your own life. No, I love that. And, and look, if anyone ever tells you, oh, but you know, curiosity killed the cat. I'm like, why do you think a cat has nine lives? Yeah. <laughs> Move on. Okay. Move on. Next. <laughs> Next. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I'm so grateful for you, Tiffany. Oh, likewise. Thank you so much, my friend. All right. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.